Thank you very much, Chris. I hope everybody can hear me uh, loud and clear. Uh, can I just test to make sure that you can hear me? Um, you are good. Please, can, please go ahead and continue. Well? Thank you. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much uh, for joining us today. Uh, excellencies, members of African Diplomatic Corps in Ottawa and Washington, DC. Excellencies, Canadian ambassadors and high commissioners who are posted in Africa. Our speakers, uh, Mr. Nengatu, Mr. Arsono, Mr. Busia, Mr. Malakor are going to be introduced uh, very shortly to our chairman who's going to be the moderator today, Benoit Lassalle, who are the chairman of the Canadian Council on Africa. Many, many, many friends have joined us from the private sector from uh, Canada, across Canada and from Africa. We are very, very pleased. We have over 500 people that are joining us. Let me just mention that if you are having difficulties in joining us on this webinar, you can also connect via uh, YouTube or first time we are uh, uh, basically broadcasting this live so you can be able to join us this way. Uh, this is exciting time. Uh, I know we have a number of uh, governments also in Africa that have joined us, such as, I mean, I will uh, mention the office of uh, uh, the president of Burkina Faso and the office of the president of uh, Namibia. We are very pleased a number of other governments that have joined us. Our partners from the Department of Trade and Industry of South Africa, very, very pleased and also many of our trade commissioners from trade commissioner services that are with us from our government global affairs all government officials from the <laughs> province to to the federal i mean i can even acknowledge from uh, the office of the prime minister of quebec um, uh, is also well represented uh, the chambers of commerce uh, across canada we are very very pleased our partners to to join us in this day Today's um, webinar is on post-COVID Africa, economic realities and business opportunities between Canada and the continent of Africa. We have world well-known speakers today that this discussion here is going to be hands-on. We are going to put the COVID aside and talk about business. They are going to tell you about Africa just before COVID and where we are right now, where are the areas of opportunities? And they are going to be telling us the whole uh, area of how do you work locally, supply chain locally. And we are going to hear from uh, our own Canadian company that is in Africa right now, because people are saying, well, listen, what, how is COVID affecting people? Well, we have a Canadian company that is operating in many, many countries in Africa that is going to be talking. At the end, we ask you not to leave quickly. At the end, we are going to tell you how you get to Africa. We have the airlines that are flying there. So all this is uh, very, very uh, tight today. So you'll be getting out with, with information that you are going really uh, to use. I would like to extend uh, a big thank you to uh, Honorable Mayor Ng, our Minister of Small Business Export Development Export Promotion and International Trade that could not be with us here today, but was kind enough to put a message because she feels this is very important, a video message for us, and it's going to be played uh, later on uh, very shortly. What is Canadian Council on Africa? Canadian Council on Africa was created uh, in 2002. Our mission is to promote trade and economic development between Canada and the continent of Africa. Why do we do that? We do this for a simple reason because we understand a couple of things that I would like just to highlight and you may hear that uh, from our speakers. But the first one, we recognize that we are friends to African, African people. We are talking about the continent. And we recognize how big is this market? 54 countries. You know, we don't make justice when we say just Africa. It's like a country. No, it's a whole continent, it's a planet with 1.2 billion people. This continent is endowed with natural resources of 
all kinds. As a matter of fact, can be looked at and has a potential to be the bread basket of the world. So why Canada? Canada, we have been there. We are a former colony, a big land, a small population, just 34 million people about. But what we have done, we have done well on developing our resources in this country, creating infrastructure that lasts, and having a sound education system, health system. These are the things that we want to take to Africa. And Africa is looking for partners. Canada it doesn't have excess of population that they want to overflow other people there. No. Canada, we have a technology, we have know-how. We want to go to Africa as a partner. We want to partner with Africa because Africa want to develop their infrastructure. Africa want to process their, um, uh, their, their, uh, their, their, their produce. Africa want to, pro to process their resources. Africa want to better the life of their people. So we want to join them as a partners to share. To our fellow Canadian, when you go to arrive in Africa, just identify yourself quickly that I'm a Canadian so that they know that uh, we are not there just to uh, invade Africa. No, we are to work in partnership. But let me put this, some people are looking at why are we talking Africa this time? There is COVID. I don't want to dive into COVID, but let's just remember one thing. Africa has known so many situations, you know, whether you talk about HIV AIDS or you talk about Ebola, you talk about colonialism, the continent has learned how to stand still. So Africa is there and Africa is strong. I mean, when we talk COVID, I want to recognize, we have been recognizing that the frontline heroes, but let me recognize some of our heroes right now our ambassadors and their offices in Africa. You have been outstanding. We saw how you have worked to mobilize, to organize repatriation of Canadians that were in a panic, how to come back home. You were there to organize with airline companies to get them back home here safely, day and night. Even the people didn't know where the Canadian embassy was. They were able to find out where is the Canadian embassy. So our Canadian, ambassadors and high commissioners, we thank you for the good work that uh, you have been doing and our trade commissioners, we thank you very, very much. You truly represent us wherever you are. So we thank you for that. Now, I want, this webinar could not happen without our team. Canadian Council on Africa, as I said, is a national organization that is across the, com uh, the country. We have a people across the country, our team, we have Frank Kens, who is in Western Canada, look after the Western provinces. He's our vice president there. And we have Patrice Malacor, who is in Atlantic, uh, who is uh, in Quebec and covering also Atlantic provinces. Uh, in Ontario here, we have Sari Ruda, who is the director of creative industries. Now, CC Africa, we are moving also in the film, videos, and gaming. These are the areas we have expertise. And also we have Chris Kianta, our vice president, business development that is based out in Ottawa. And me, I'm in a big city of Toronto. So we are across Canada covering uh, the, uh, uh, the country. So you can reach us anywhere where you are. So we are very, very pleased. And I would like to recognize, CC Africa, we don't just work with members. We work with partners. We believe in a partnership. We see ourselves pulling in other people to work with us. And this is, this is why recently we have signed a number of agreements with partners such as Mining Suppliers, Trade uh, Association of Canada. Uh, also, we have signed agreement with uh, uh, Canadian International Resource Development uh, Institute. Also, we, we have uh, signed agreement with uh, the National Film Foundation of South Africa um, and the Department of Trade and Industry of South Africa. But we work with everybody, all industry associations, and that's how we believe that we can be able to deliver our mandate and to help you because we don't need to reinvent. You are a chamber of commerce. You are a business association. We love you. We can work with you, with your members. We can bring platform like this so that we can be able to drive the, the, your, your message.
So this is what Canadian Council on Africa is, and we are very pleased to work across the continent. So in today, I'm just going to ask you, please forget about coronavirus. I know many of you have become professional teachers right now, with those who have young children, and you love it. And some of you, you love doing your chores, but Africa is here. We cannot do what we are doing. People are saying, telling this is a new normal. This is not a new normal for me. The normal is you get in the plane, you go to Africa, where you meet your friends, you talk to them, you drink fresh coffee from Ethiopia or cocoa from Ghana or Cote d'Ivoire, or you can go eat prawns in uh, Namibia or King Clip in, um, uh, in South Africa. So listen, you, you, you can go, the, the continent is so beautiful. I mean, so 54 countries for you to be content. So without further ado, I'm going to pass you now to our chairman. Now our, our chairman is a man with history himself. This is a man that went to Africa first with humanitarian group, just look at, okay, how can we have poor Africans? But he went there, he had an entrepreneurial glasses and he looked and said, yeah, hey, Portuguese is in Africa. Why are you saying Africa is poor? And he has been a pioneer in setting up a company there, which has been very, very successful. And now he's involved in executive of many companies that are involved in Africa because that has been his mission to push Canadian companies to look at Africa as a partner, as a place to be. So without further ado, uh, join me to welcome our chairman, Benoit Lassar. Benoit to you. Yes, thank you, Nola. Thank you. Uh, Nola, uh, thank you for this introduction. Uh, and uh, it's always uh, <clears throat> extremely important to explain why the Canadian Council is there and the opportunity that exists. Uh, thank you for organizing this uh, post-COVID-19 uh, conference. Uh, I know you, you don't want us to talk about COVID, but COVID is, has changed the world. It's changed business. It's, it will continue to change business. It will change the world. And, and we have great speakers today to address those issues. I'll act as the, uh, the moderator, uh, but um, as, as you, you, most of you know, uh, we are involved in uh, solar energy uh, in Africa and, and it's uh, in, in Burkina Faso, in Senegal, in Niger and uh, many other countries. Uh, solar is changing the world now and post COVID it will be even more aggressive. Uh, I don't know that you, you, you all saw the, the new Tesla battery that was announced this week, which now is much cheaper than gasoline at any price. So we're moving towards this new economy. And, and of course, Africa will be part of this. Uh, mining, uh, we're involved in mining in many, many countries. Mining currently is slow that has, has, has been slowed down. But as soon as the recovery is coming in into the new world, uh, people believe that we're gonna head into the greatest boom ever that we will have seen because of all the money printing that's been done and that's going to be done by all the, the developed countries' banks and the central banks and the European banks, and even the IMF will set hundreds of billions aside for the, new, uh, the, for the economies to grow. So I was talking to friends in the r and business and they're getting ready for the biggest demand ever in r and because the, 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 the governments are gonna use infrastructure uh, to restart the economies and to put people back at work. So iron ore is gearing up for massive demand, nickel, copper for massive demand. The battery energy is also gearing up for massive demand. So it's very interesting what's happening. And again, for Africa, you, Africa will be the source of, of all these materials. And you also have agriculture where we're involved in agriculture in, in, in mainly in North and West Africa. And it's the same thing. And why all of that is even more important now, agriculture, mining, and energy to, to support all of that, is there is a massive reset at the moment in supply chain management. It's not true that we will rely 80, 90% on one source of supply for medicine, for food, for energy, for batteries, for, it's just not going to happen. We've just lived through hell 
in COVID-19 to understand where the mask are gonna be coming from, the respirators, the hand soap, all of that, it's not happening anymore in supply chain management that we will depend on a few countries. And I think all of that is a massive push for Africa. It's, 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 it's a new opportunity where the world is, is, is going to a reset. And, and we're seeing it, we're feeling it, uh, and you'll have the same thing in uranium. I mean, uranium for a while was, you know, a topic you can talk about, and now it's changing because it, at the end, it probably will be the solution for many, many uh, countries. So we're in a position where the world is changing rapidly. It, COVID accelerated everything. It stopped fighting in many regions of the world. It's got people together like never before. And the after COVID potential of businesses between Canada and, and Africa, I, I don't believe has never been as hot, as good. And that's why we have these outstanding speakers. I, I'm gonna leave it to them to go through why what they see. But I, 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 I see, I feel we're being told and we're being asked for material, for energy, for agriculture, and all this is, is, is accelerating. We're now in a bit of a, a slow period because COVID is not yet fixed. So that's, it, it has slowed down the financial markets and, 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 and some of other markets. But it, when it's coming out, when we're coming out of this, it'll be the biggest boom ever, ever, ever that you will have seen. So I would like to introduce the, uh, the presentation by the honorary uh, Mary Ng, our Minister of Small Business, Export, Promotion and International Trade for the Government of Canada. She was with us at Mining in Daba. She's visited uh, African countries, Kenya, Ethiopia. You know, our Prime Minister has been to Ethiopia He's been to Senegal with three ministers. So we, we do have momentum currently in, in Canada. Yes, we're set back with COVID. We all understand this, but there's a clear, clear vision uh, with the Canadian government, with even with the Quebec government on, on going into Africa is, is, is a priority. So I would like to uh, let the presentation go by the, by the, the, the honorary minister on, uh, for this conference. Please. Hello, everyone. I'm sorry that I couldn't join you on this webinar, but I'm happy that technology has allowed me to share a few words with you today. I want to start by thanking Nola and your team for all of your hard work, your determination and your leadership. It was fantastic to put Canada's trade diversification strategy into action earlier this year in February really does seem like a lifetime ago when we all attended mining in Daba in South Africa and then led a business trade mission to Kenya and Ethiopia and then joined Prime Minister Trudeau at the African Union Summit. Throughout the visit, we saw businesses from Canada and African countries building relationships and learning from each other and sharing innovative ideas and solutions. Even through all of the changes, it remains true that Africa wants more Canada, and indeed Canada wants more Africa. In the weeks and months to come, we are working to maintain the relationships that we've all worked so hard to build between Canada and African nations. This work perhaps is more crucial now than ever. Alors que le monde est confronté à une période incroyablement difficile, nous allons le traverser ensemble en nous écoutant les unes les autres et en répondant aux besoins de nos entreprises et de nos citoyens. Our government believes that supporting people economically at the same time as protecting their health is the best way to help people through this extraordinary time amid COVID-19. We announced significant measures to help people and businesses, such as our emergency response benefit, giving $2,000 to Canadians making under a thousand dollars per month and who have lost their income due to COVID-19 or a 75 percent wage subsidy to help businesses pay their employees and keep their people employed. Lending supports to help businesses with cash flow, reducing commercial rent by 75 percent 
for our small businesses and much more. I can assure you that we continue to listen to business owners and to respond to their needs. We also know that an open and a stable supply chain are crucial to helping our businesses weather this storm. That's why we are working with our international partners to keep trade and supply chains open so that Canadian businesses and enterprises across the globe have the stability they need. And so that the people can continue to access essential goods and services during this critical time. And as we look to the road ahead, we know that growing our trade links in African nations are necessary for our mutual economic recovery. This includes pursuing negotiations with Ethiopia to develop a foreign investment promotion and protection agreement, adding to the eight FIPAs Canada already has with African nations, providing a more transparent and predictable trading environment. We want to build strong, effective, and equal partnerships and advance our shared priorities, including economic security, trade and growth, climate change, and peace and security. Even through these difficult times, we are committed to strengthening those partnerships, building on those priorities, and deepening the people-to-people -people ties between Canada and the nations of Africa. We will get through this together. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thank you uh, to our minister, Mary Ng. Uh, and that will, uh, we will launch the discussion. Uh, our first speaker is somebody we know extremely well at the Canadian Council uh, on Africa. Uh, Mr. Zemede Negatu is, is a friend of the organization. He's been to many of our conferences. Uh, him and I share something. We're both former uh, uh, ENY, uh, where we uh, started our careers. Uh, actually, you started your careers, I think, at Price Waterhouse, and uh, I started at ENY, but we were from the same, uh, same school. Uh, he's widely known uh, in Africa and received many uh, uh, honorary distinction as business leader. He was named as top 10 most influential African in 2010 and received many other distinction. Uh, he's uh, from uh, Ethiopia, but also lived in America and Canada and Brazil, Argentina, Saudi Arabia. Uh, he is currently the global chairman of the American investment firm Fairfax uh, African Fund based in Washington, DC. Uh, Fairfax is very known to us in Canada and uh, Fairfax focuses on five sectors, manufacturing, infrastructure, natural resources, hospitality and agro processing business. Um, Zemede was at er Ernst & Young for many, many years, for 18 years, uh, founded Ernst & Young uh, Ethiopia. He served on the tra transaction advisory services for East Africa and, um, and member of the EY Global Partner Council. So uh, it's an individual we see often on the BBC, CNBC, uh, Bloomberg, uh, FT, so somebody, someone that's, uh, that we know, that we recognize, and he serves on 10 boards globally, including Investment Africa based in London. So Zemede, without more uh, of an introduction, we, we know you well, please, uh, it's your turn. All right, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever everybody is, I see a lot of people online, uh, Benoit, Thank you, Nola and CCA and everybody else. Thank you for having me back. I'm a good friend, as you said, of CCA. Uh, good to be back, especially in times that have changed dramatically since we last saw each other in person. So what I thought today I'll do is, and as the heading of this uh, webinar is post COVID that we need to talk about in Africa. So I've prepared a, a few slides, more talking points, but it's a macro picture because you have other speakers who do a deep dive, drill down on specific sectors and other things. I wanted to give you my take and what I see across Africa, obviously around the world here in Washington, where I am, uh, what we think about Africa, why invest in Africa? Essentially, that's the argument, why Canada should invest in Africa, why Africa should do business with uh, Canada. That's the theme of my presentation. So what I wanted to do is essentially present a realistically optimistic view 
of doing business in Africa. Okay. Now, as you can see from the first slide here, the title of the presentation is Post-COVID-19 Africa, Economic Realities and Opportunities Between Canada and Africa. I don't have very many slides, but in the interest of time, what I'll do is uh, just go through it fairly quickly so that maybe we'll have a point of discussion as we go along. So let me just see if the slides can work. Uh, let me just, just give me a second. Yeah, that's it. So as the minister said uh, in her opening remarks, uh, President uh, Prime Minister Trudeau was in Africa, and particularly in Ethiopia. I had the honor of meeting him at a, a business luncheon. And it was encouraging to see the Prime Minister of Canada in Africa. It shows the seriousness, the, the willingness of Canada to engage Africa. He was in, in Ethiopia and also, as I just said, in Senegal. So just wanted to put that out there because uh, this is a continuation of the visit by him and the minister and others in his delegation to show commitment for Africa. Now, so why would you want to invest in Africa? Why, why would you do business with Africa? Canada is a rich country, uh, has a lot of other opportunities. And I'm going to try to make a case for why. Now, as I said, we need to see beyond COVID, the here and now. It's important that we don't get swamped between, between the challenges that we face, as real as it is, as devastating as it is, unemployments are high everywhere, economies have been shut down, and including in Africa. I think we should see what would Africa, what would Canada, what would the rest of the world look like maybe six months from now, a year from now, 18, 12, 20, 18 months from now. It's important to put that in perspective in order to talk about investment, okay? So the main reason really is the economy. What does that mean? So for those of you who are able to see the slides, what, what I've done is look at the ranking or the, the aggregation of the bigger economies in Africa. And there's another What we need to look at is this actual concentration of economy amongst the top five and then beyond that, the top 10 African economies. So when we look at the biggest one, which is Nigeria, it accounts for a quarter of Africa's economy, followed by South Africa, which is about 21% of the total. And then you have Kenya, Angola, and Ethiopia. These are the sort of the top five. They aggregate, they account for, but this is Sub-Saharan Africa. In fact, by the way, I wanted to emphasize throughout my presentation, much of my talk is about Sub-Saharan Africa because the, the, there are a lot of commonalities. There are a lot of things that Sub-Saharan Africa has uh, compared to say Northern Africa which has some different dynamics. So the presentation here is about Sub-Saharan Africa. And then when you take these five, they account for about 62, 63% of the GDP of Sub-Saharan Africa. And then when you add the next five, they together account for almost 80% of the continent's GDP, to be precise, 77%. Now, when we look at Africa, sometimes there's the notion that Africa is too small, maybe. I mean, I looked at the Canadian Africa trade figure, and to be honest, it's less than 1% of Canada's exports goes to Africa. Now, somebody in Canada might say, well, you know, why bother if it's less than 1%? Well, here's the figure. Sub-Saharan Africa's total GDP is 1.7 trillion, which is about the same size as Canada's GDP. And then when you include North Africa, it, it's closer to two, two and a half trillion. I don't think anybody should say two and a half trillion is small. It needs to grow and it will grow. But when we look at where we came from as Africa, so if you go back to 2000, is only about 570 billion. Today, it's three and a half times. So at that kind of exponential growth, I think you will see the opportunities in Africa in numbers. So the reason I showed the bigger economies is because like we saw in Asia, if you have larger economies, especially on the coastal areas in the East, the West and the South, they like just like China did and the other Asian, the Japan did, they can pull up the rest of the continent, the countries around it, and create critical mass. So it's important to have sizable economies in Africa. Now, that's where we are today. But I think as investors, both in Africa and in Canada, you are forward looking. And as I said, if you go back to Africa's history in the 70s, 80s, we, we call it the lost decades. Even the 1990s were not much better. But when you look at these graphs, you'll see starting in the 2000s, you see a lot of greens. And this is, by the way, data we got from the, from the IMF. And you can see starting in the 2000s, a lot of African countries had started to do well. The peak, I would say, was in the two, 2010 era, the, the following four or five years, almost all of the continent was growing rapidly. And then 
things started sliding, especially the collapse of commodity prices. But I think 2019. Now, if you look at the bottom side of the graphs today, the whole world is, is in red, except you would see four or five countries in Africa, including my, my birth country, Ethiopia, that are expected to grow, but everybody else is sliding as to be expected. What I wanted you to look at the right graph where almost all of Africa starting in 2021, we'd be back on track and the growth trajectory. As Benoit said earlier, we expect a lot of uh, capital inflows to come back to Africa. A lot of activities from the IMF, the World Bank, and others, the G20s, a lot of the activities that attach the, the initiatives that they could taken, and the reforms that Africa is doing will start showing real, to realize the benefits. And I want to add something here. Why would Africa grow? Obviously, it's a very rich continent, and I'll show that in a couple of slides, but a lot of reforms have taken both on the political front. Uh, today, every African country uh, goes through a democratic process on like the 70s and 80s. A lot of business reform processes have taken place. So you're going to start seeing a lot of good results, positive results throughout Africa. Some countries are outliers. They'll grow by 8 and 9%. Ethiopia, one of them, maybe Rwanda and a few other places. But all will start showing results. So that's what we need to keep in mind. If we continue on this path, as I said, this is a forward-looking, realistically positive presentation. There are forecasts that show that by 2050, the total GDP of Africa will be around $29 trillion. That's a very large number. How big is it? Well, it's, the, it's equal to the US economy today, plus Japan and Germany combined. I mean, that, that is a powerful number we need to keep in mind, $29 trillion. That also can be translated into purchasing power. We have some data that show even closer for the purchasing powers of consumer and businesses to be close to $7 trillion. And this is source that we got from the oh, These are just some macro pictures I want to share with you before I give you some specifics and then and go through the details. I want to keep in mind something though. All this is predicated in what I call globalization 2.0. As was said in the beginning, in the openings, uh, a lot of nationalism taking place here in the United States. Uh, America first is the guiding principle. And many European countries are now uh, looking into that. That means globalization, as we knew it in the last 20, 30 years, will have a different phase. However, it will still be beneficial, in my view, to Africa. The way the globalization 2.0 will head will benefit Africa tremendously. Uh, reshoring. Maybe not necessarily to, to the Canada or the United States or the European, but reshoring it to African countries, I think, is a possibility. And it's actually a real possibility that Africa can take over. The other opportunity for Africa is, and then for Canadian investors and others, why would they do invest in, in, in Africa? Is because there's an unmistakable gradual shift of economic power from West to East. Gradual, but unmistakable. So the growth will be in Asia. That means Africa is beautifully positioned to take advantage of. So this is sort of the outlook for Africa. Now, uh, as Benoit said earlier, I was at EY for many years and we used to put together this thing called the Afri Africa Attractiveness Survey. And I was part of the team that contributed some of the data. I've always liked that one of the couple of the graphs we used to put together and I wanted to show you uh, because this is a global conference and especially for the Canadians, who is investing in Africa from an FDI perspective. At the end of the day, that gives you an indication of how much confidence there is in Africa. There's a rearranging of the deck and it's important to keep that in mind. And the largest investor by capital from accumulatively from 2014 to 2018, the last data we have is Canada, about $72 billion. And next is the United States, but about half of what China has invested. You have France, UK, UA, and so on. What you don't see here, it may not come as a surprise to Canadians is Canada is not in the top 10. I'm sure it could be changed, but at the moment, Canada is not in the top 10. But what I always looked at is how much contribution did FDI make to Africa in terms of job creation? That's also important because in Africa, we have a lot of young people and I'll show you in a second. So again, China was the largest generator of jobs in Africa cumulatively from 04 to 018, followed by the US, France, UK and, and the UAE. Again, it's important. The one place where there is a slight rearranging of the, of the ranking is when we look at FDI by number of projects, uh, the French are number one, the US is number two, China is actually number four. But 
overall, China is now the largest. So when we talk about who are the major investors in Africa, I think we need to have the discuss the big elephant in the room, which is which is China. Again, for Canada, that needs to be factored in because of the G7 countries, uh, four are in the top ten. Is not one of them. I, and I, Canada resources, the ability, the, the talent to rearrange. There is the number one, and this is for last year, uh, the, the largest number by projects, by, by sector, was TMT, which is technology uh, medium, and, and the followed by consumer products, which is the CPR. So, however, uh, as has been indicated in other places as well, by value, by dollar value, the extractive sector is still the main attraction in Africa. But that has to change because it's still extractive as the word describes, it's not value addition or beneficiation. So, so that was just a quick snapshot. Now in the business that we're in, the private equity, I thought I would show you if you'd like to because it has making significant contribution in Africa or although relatively from a low base and compared to the global. But in uh, between 2014 and 2019, private equity has invested to 25 billion, over $25 billion in Africa in about a thousand transactions. So again, this is just an indication that even private equity, which is very aggressive, very uh, focused uh, and looking for returns is making very significant contribution in Africa. So and in a snapshot, that's sort of the macro picture of Africa's economy. Having said that, and I wanna go through this very quickly so maybe the other speakers have a chance and also questions to be asked. What are the growth drivers that we see in Africa and what should investors, the Canadian investors and others should, should Keep in mind as well. This is what I call the growth. One of the key growth drivers is demographics. I think you all have heard about it. It's a very young uh, continent. The median age is under 20. Not only is it under 20, but it's very young. So today there's about 1.3 billion people in Africa. Uh, there are forecasts. If Africans will be could be deployed, creating opportunities for investors. The other growth driver is urbanization. Uh, there's mixed bags, so there are, there are different schools of thought about how should we manage urbanization, but uh, there's unmistakable unanimity that urbanization, if managed well, can bring benefit. Again, here, Africa is one of the least urbanized continents in the world, but over the next 15 to 20 years, it's expected to be one of the most urbanized, meaning wealth creation is there. People who produce for an urban class, urbanized countries, companies, investors could do very well. So we have some forecasts that say that uh, by 2030, there'll be 34 African countries with, with 34 African cities with over 3 million in population. Uh, again, and there are some others that are even more dramatic than that. So urbanization will be another growth driver for Africa. Beyond that, and then when we would drill down into sectors as growth drivers, it goes without saying infrastructure is probably by far, and this is where I think Canada has a lot of strength with complementary uh, with, with what Africa is needed. There are estimates that show that between 130, 170 billion dollars a year in infrastructure needs out there in Africa. The challenge here is the, the financing gap estimated between 68 to 108 billion, which can be filled. By the way, what we discussed today, we need to think differently. We, we it can't just say, well, Canadian companies don't do this and don't do that. Well, you have a lot of big institutional investors in Canada that can funnel their money or through private equity funds, the pension funds can link up with others. So there are creative ways for Canada to partner with Africa in many of these sectors that I'm discussing, especially including infrastructure. Of course, Canada is very good at the energy sector, uh, railway, I mean, Bombardier does fantastic railways and subways and things like that, and the telecom and, and other sectors. So in summary, infrastructure would be a major attraction for Canadian investors. Now, the next one might come as a surprise to many people. Technology in Africa, the digital revolution or digitization of Africa may not be the first thing that comes to mind for a lot of investors, not just Canadians or Americans or anywhere, but it is actually showing big results. Why is that? Well, I have some data here, hopefully you can see it. Today, there's almost 450 million African cell phones in Africa, unique subscribers to mobile phones that's forecast to go to 623 million in five years from now. Most of the phones today, less than 40% are smartphones that's expected to be almost 70% in five years. And then the mobile penetration, yes, relatively speaking, it's small today, about 239 million, 
but it will reach about half a billion in the next, we're talking about next four or five years here. So these are big numbers. Leveraging that, I think you can see a lot of smart young Africans have started investing and developing talented applications, products that is serving a lot of Africans. So for example, mobile financial services is actually much more in use in Africa than it is in, in the US or Canada or the developed world. That's because the, the unbanked was a key driver for innovation in Africa. So companies like Impesa in Kenya uh, are leaders in that area. We see uh, ride-sharing companies, uh, like in my country in Ethiopia, uh, and Ethiopia's version of Uber was developed by young people. Again, the, the, uh, the availability of mobile technology is allowing Africans, and as I said, mobile financial services, uh, this, this company that uh, Fairfax is an investor in called Hello Cash, which has you know, several million customers. So using your phone as you bank is now. So technology, Africa's digital revolution should give a lot of people opportunities. E-government is now being rolled out. In fact, if one thing we learned about COVID, what has come out of COVID is the need to roll out uh, government services and other services online. Even this discussion we're having today is, is enabled by technology in, in Africa. So remember the young, dynamic, talented population I talked about that could easily be deployed to become innovative. Companies, online marketing firms like Jumia, which had uh, very high valuations. These are the kinds of opportunities that Canadians and Africans can partner on to develop the continent and benefit from the opportunity. So that's another. Another growth driver is and I won't dwell too much on it because the other speakers, uh, Dr. Kojo Busia, will be talking about this. But I want to just leave you with some numbers on the natural resource space. I think it will blow away a lot of people's mind to see it, so much resource is still not fully utilized by Africa. It's, why? Well, we know, look at about 30% of the world's known reserves of minerals are in Africa. cobalt, diamonds, platinum, you name it. However, it's still underexploited. And more importantly, this is the, the thing that I hear about from a lot of African decision makers when we talk to them with the government officials or business executives, the beneficiation is done offshore. What it could very easily be done in Africa, both the, the host country and the investors can benefit considerably if it is done. So take this as it is. I honestly believe there's a huge opportunity here for both localizing the processing uh, and and I know Nola has some innovative ideas in this area of you know creating that benefit in Africa, but I think consider natural resources, of course, without without saying that there is a huge opportunity. And then a couple of sectors, and I'll I'll wrap up. Agriculture. Listen, uh, maybe Canadians won't go and, and farm on African farmlands, but there are other areas you can participate in the value addition. But here's the numbers that I think should be kept in mind as we think about the opportunities in Africa. 60% of the globe, the world's arable, uncultivated arable land is in Africa. And yet in Africa, we import last year $40 billion of food, which is forecast to reach over 110 billion by 2025 in the next five years. That means there's opportunity for value addition. I mean, I have a little picture there of beautiful Ethiopian coffee. There's a cocoa at the bottom that you see. A lot of this stuff can be value added in Africa on the ground and exported to the rest of the world at competitive cost, by the way. Competitive cost, but at quality. So think of agriculture as, as an area of opportunity as well. And then the tourism sector, it's kind of sad, of course, the sector has been hit real hard around the world. Um, the hotels around the world have five, 10% occupancy. The airline industry is decimated. Every, it seems like every day we open the newspapers, there's one more news of airlines going out of business, filing for bankruptcy, whether it's South African Airways yesterday, it was Thai Airways here in the United States. A lot of the airlines are struggling. The US but we need to think, as I said, the here and now, the six months, 12 months, a year from now, and say, is there an opportunity in Africa in the tourism sector? Can Canadian companies, can Africans partner together to develop that sector? And the answer is absolutely yes. And let me just tell you why. Yes, tourism contributes about what? Eight and a half percent to Africa's GDP, which is about almost $200 billion. That's, that's okay, but considering the opportunity is still low. 67 million international tourist arrivals in Africa. You say, wow, that's a lot. Well, to be honest with you, that's very low. Dubai airport alone, 90 million people passed through Dubai airport last year, 90 million. So we're talking about 54 countries, 67. That means the upside is there. Of course, the sector still employs millions of Africans. That's a plus, but more can be employed. However, 
all this figure uh, amounts to Africa accounting for 5% of the world's international tourism arrivals, just 5%. And Africa today, last year, received only 1% of the 1.7 trillion of the world's tourism earnings. Keep that in mind, 1.7 trillion and Africa only gets 1%. So that means there's huge opportunity here. If you add it, if you take that to 2% or 3%, imagine over 1.7 trillion. So again, the tourism sector as decimated as it is across the world and including Africa today, when post COVID, I think there's going to be a huge revival. And then uh, one other thing, which I know it may sound like an oxymoron for a lot of people to have the same sentence of Africa and manufacturing in one line, but I honestly believe there is real possibility for Africa to be an industrialized continent. We have some examples here, very good examples. That when we look at people like Dangote, who has rolled out manufacturing facilities, especially in the infrastructure space, especially in cement production and other things, we know it's doable. In, in Ethiopia, which has one of the, it's really been very focused on rolling out these massive industrial parks. It's attracted a lot of international investors. Again, as indications, it, it is doable in Africa when you see these kinds of examples. We have a lot of it in Kenya, the same thing, and Tanzania. Across Africa, we have flickerings of uh, that there is opportunity in the manufacturing sector. Yes, it takes a lot. The infrastructure has to be there. The, the, the other elements, the, the logistics, all those things need to come with it, but it is doable. We can export. And as I said at the beginning, and, and the globalization 2.0, the reshoring, or at least the taking things out of China right now is a real possibility that is being discussed by the G7 countries, which will be meeting, meeting here in the United States next month, apparently. Uh, but it is a real possibility. The Europeans, yes, some critical things will still go back to their own countries, maybe pharmaceuticals or other things, but a lot of the stuff that is now being produced in China, especially that they are the cost can be reshored to Africa. And this is where Africa has a golden opportunity, a unique opportunity to capture this moment and bring back, I mean, there's a data that shows 85 million jobs are looking to leave China. And this is pre-COVID, by the way, because the Chinese didn't want to do shoe manufacturing or leather manufacturing or clothing manufacturing. I think they've become too wealthy. That means Africans, the 1.3 billion I talked about, that will be doubling by 2050, are actually in a position, and this is where I think Canadians and Africans can partner and other investors can partner to take advantage of the manufacturing opportunity that Africa presents. And then finally, this is my final uh, talk, all this, We'll have all this production that we do, all the stuff that we do in Africa, it will be accelerated, over turbocharged because of some big things that has happened in Africa in this past year, which is the Africa Continental Free Trade Area, which is the world's largest free trade, the world's largest, I repeat that. That means the entire continent would be one free trade area. Now, it was supposed to be launched next month because of COVID, it's been slightly delayed, but a year from now, on, or a few months from now when it's launched, and that means the whole continent and a phased approach, but still uh, open to everybody who operates in Africa will have the continent for itself. Uh, excellent opportunity. In addition to that, if you invest in Africa, if you do business in Africa and in places like Ethiopia or Nigeria or Ghana, wherever you are, you can still export all your stuff to the Europeans uh, under what's called everything but arms uh, duty-free agreement. And here in the United States, you can ship everything from Africa under the Agora. So these are, which, these are great opportunities, free trade arrangements that gives competitive advantages to Africa that no one else has. Obviously, other than Canada, Mexico, the US, you have a special arrangement. But beyond that, I think this will be, so you could have up to 30, 40% cost advantages be, uh, when you arrive in the United States, when you arrive in Europe, just because you have duty-free and quarter-free privilege. So in summary, these are all the key areas that I think will make Africa uh, an attractive. And that's why I think uh, cert certainly at, at, at Fairfax, uh, we're very good at doing business, hopefully in Africa, both on the investment banking side, but on the investment, on the actual private equity, and we do venture capital as well. We look at Africa positively. Are there challenges? Yes. Are there opportunities? Plenty. So there are ways to ring fence uh, the risks, but I also want to point out honestly that not every African country is growing, not every African country is collapsing. There are extremes. There are some that are doing fantastically. There are some that are still in post-crisis and the vast majority in Africa 
are doing well will do well. As I said, the IMF had a forecast before COVID in January, only three, four months ago, that the continent would grow by 3.2, 3.4%. Of course, now they're looking at minus 1.6 for this year only. So it'll go back to that level. So if you're looking at a continent with what, two and a half, 2.6 trillion growing by 4%, you can add up the numbers, but you need to be selective. You got to do your due diligence, you stay focused. And a lot of Africans have done a lot of reforms or are in the process of doing reform. I mean, Rwanda, for example, stands out. It's in, in the top 50 of the best places in, in, uh, in the world to do business. There are others. Uh, and, and again, in Ethiopia has introduced massive reforms agenda to move up, to ease, to make it easier. A lot of African countries do that. So the reforms are real. They will take time, but they're real. So investors who are in there for the long run. My final point, Africa is a long-term play. I would not suggest Africa for asset flippers, okay? It would need people who are serious, who are there for the long haul, who want to be part of the community, who want to invest with the community and benefit themselves and the communities and the countries that they're in. If you do that, and we are, I mean, I speak as an investor, as an advisor, uh, we, I think there are serious opportunities, real meaningful opportunities in the next 5, 10, 15 to 20 years in Africa. So in summary, uh, CCA, NOLA, uh, Benoit, thank you for inviting me. And it's a, it's a pleasure. If there are any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I was just trying to put my, my mic back on. Uh, Zemede, thank you so much. I mean, you're, you're, you're hitting the nail right on. It's exactly what we see at the Canadian Council. It's, it's your, your presentation was really, really to the point, and uh, I'm sure we will have many, many questions. Uh, we will move on to our second speaker, uh, Dr. Kojo Busia. Uh, Dr. Busia is currently the Chief of Natural Resource Management Section Division of Technology, Climate Change, and Natural Resource Management at the UN Economic Commission for Africa. Uh, from 2014 to 2019, he served as the coordinator of the African Mineral Development Center, uh, uh, a Pan-African Center of Excellence, charged with the implementation of the African Mining Vision, an African Union policy initiative for sustainable mineral resource development. While working primarily in the policy and regulation aspect of the mining sector, Dr. Busa has equal skills, expertise, and experience in the economics, environmental, social, and governance sustainability dimension of mining companies and their supply chain. I, I think the timing is excellent to have you, uh, Dr. Busia, as a speaker, um, as, as we just saw, the, the next wave of growth is coming. It, there, to me, there's no doubt. And often when there's growth and there's infrastructure growth and there's need for material, it's done in, in, in a very quick way. And, and we've seen that in Africa, in different countries where the need for the material, you know, was way, uh, the, the priority was much greater than the ESG needs and, and, and it, it can happen that it's not done properly. So I turn it over to you. Your pedigree is amazing. And, and the timing to have you as a speaker is, is, is excellent. Dr. Boucher. Uh, thank you, uh, Benoit. And uh, also let me, let me thank uh, NOLA and the Canadian Council of Africa uh, for inviting me to be a part of this uh, uh, timely webinar. Uh, as you put it, uh, I'm very pleased to be speaking on behalf of the Economic Commission for Africa. Um, first, let me also uh, take this opportunity to thank the Canadian government uh, for its leadership role over the years uh, in supporting Africa in developing its natural resources uh, over the years. Uh, indeed, uh, if you have been following, Canada has been a major partner uh, in African mineral resource development, uh, having contributed uh, over the last 10 years to the setting up of the African Mineral Development Center, which was uh, housed in UNECA and, and which I was privileged to have led over the last five years. Uh, the center is now an African Union flagship center, which is now uh, taken over by the African Union uh, Secretariat in Addis Ababa. Uh, when we talk about mining, of course, Canadian mining companies 
uh, are major players in African continent, whether you're talking about major mining companies uh, like Kinross and others, but also a host of other junior mining companies that are taking the risk in terms of mining exploration and also development of world-class mining assets throughout the continent. Uh, in fact, uh, about 60% of equity financing uh, for mining exploration do come from Canada, from publicly listed companies uh, that come from Canada. So Canada is a major investor uh, in African minerals, particularly in the upstream uh, exploration phase. And of course, in most of the other sectors, which uh, uh, Zamede had already mentioned, Canada is a player um, and, and indeed uh, it has a presence uh, in terms of, uh, of trade and investment in Africa. And if you think about the post-COVID period, in fact, uh, we, we do expect that Canada's role will be pivotal uh, in terms of shaping the new paradigm uh, that is emerging uh, in the post-COVID period in Africa. I think my focus is on supply chains because of all the things that have happened with COVID in, on the economic side, I think the most, the most visible uh, impact of COVID on the global economy is the fragmentation and the seemingly uh, devastating impact it's had on, on, on global supply chains. And of course, if you talk about supply chains, uh, the sector of natural resources, indeed all sectors, but also natural resource sector has been hardly hit. The global attention has been focused rightly on the medical sector or the pharmaceutical medical sector uh, with concern to PPEs uh, and the shortages that have been uh, registered due to disruptions in the uh, supply chains of PPEs. But I think all sectors are equally impacted uh, with the global supply chains being concentrated uh, you know, uh, essentially in, in China. Now, uh, one of the examples uh, that of the sectors is the car manufacturing sector, the electronics as well, but also, as I mentioned, the, the, the mining sector. Um, the, the point being that most of the manufacturing or processing plants have been closed as a result of the, of the breakdown uh, in the supply chain, therefore causing constraints uh, to the, uh, uh, the distribution of supplies that are critical to the operations of most of the mines across the continent. The lockdowns, as we have witnessed, have impaired smooth operations of mining sites in several jurisdictions across uh, the continent. And, and this has affected countries differently. Um, some jurisdictions are more impacted than others, but by and large, we have seen that some of these uh, affecting uh, mining operations. Um, mining is a unique sector because it's a 24 seven hour sector uh, and, and, and any kind of uh, stoppage in operations have a major impact in terms of operational risk to mining sector meeting targets of production and, and so on. But I think by and large, as I said, depending on the jurisdiction that the mines are located, we have had a, a relatively well-managed disruption uh, of, of the supply chains on, on the sector. And, and, and in fact, some of them have sort of, depending on the regulations that the, the mining uh, I mean, the, 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 the governments in these jurisdictions have put in place to manage COVID-19. We've had sort of a, a fairly well-managed uh, supply, supply sector that, uh, I mean, supply chains uh, to, the, to the issues that we are talking about. Typically you have uh, supplies like the ties, uh, spare parts, uh, other mineral processing inputs uh, like the chemicals and, and, and some, some of those uh, you know, consumables in the sector that usually runs out uh, due to short sort of uh, time frame for stockpiling uh, that have been affected. Um, the issue of climate change, which is also linked to my uh, 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 presentation, comes in because the kinds of supply shortages that we are witnessing is similar to the climate um, change 
caused supply chain constraints that we are bound to face in the future. Obviously, extreme weather conditions creates disruptions that are almost identical, if not the same, to the, uh, uh, the smooth operations of supplies uh, globally. So the anticipation of climate cost events that will create shortages must be factored in in terms of what kinds of resilience that we build and what kinds of strategies that African governments will have to devise in the future in terms of uh, uh, preventing uh, uh, some of these uh, uh, problems that we've had. But let's look at the, the, uh, the, short, uh, the responses that most governments have, have tried to, to come up with, uh, with a view towards imagining the future of how this would look like. Um, and, and here we am proposing here, and I think most observers, and I think uh, the speakers before me alluded to the fact that globally across the globe, I think the reaction to COVID-19 uh, in terms of this uh, huge massive impact on supplies is the ultimate outcome would be the fragmentation of supply chains and, and, and rightly so not in a negative sense, but at least the regionalization and the localization of supplies across all sectors. So the point here is that um, any future uh, strategies or shift in paradigm must focus on how do we create sustainable, dependable, resilient mining supply chains uh, within uh, the African economies. And, and, and some of these things have already been alluded to by Zemede already. So the next slide, please. So overall, the responses that have come uh, across Africa uh, in terms of mining companies reacting to the supply chain breakdown have fallen into threefold. One is the immediate response of how do you manage, uh, particularly with regard to the workforce um, uh, in terms of the mine site. Um, you know, taking into consideration some of the restrictions that are put in place, the lockdowns the governments have implemented. How do you react to that and how do you manage that? Which also bears on the issues of the uh, environment, social and, and governance issues, uh, which is extremely important to any reputable uh, mining companies. And of course, closely linked to that is how do you manage supply chains resilience themselves? Uh, what strategies do you have to, how do you adjust your strategy so that you're able to uh, do what trade-offs are necessary in the medium uh, to long term so that you can better uh, manage for any future. And, and thirdly, uh, the discussion has already begun uh, in, in various quarters among stakeholders as to how do you reimagine supply chains in Africa over the long term. Um, and, and some of which have already been discussed by the speakers uh, before me. But in immediate response, basically, uh, is, it's, it's the issue of uh, protecting your, your health, uh, the health of your workforce. Uh, the issues of PPPs, mining companies, uh, directly engaging in procuring uh, personal protection equipment, um, you know, making sure that they're compliance with the social distances, requirements and lockdowns, requirements that are being put in place by host governments, and actually going beyond that in terms of supporting communities to manage also uh, the health and with regard to some of the issues of uh, uh, water, sanitation, uh, hospitals or clinics, uh, and even the provision of, uh, of, of electricity and others that will help the immediate community, but also the larger society uh, at large. And I think this is extremely important because as we all know, uh, over the last few years, and again, the issue of climate change comes very close because the investor activism with regard to ESG has been extremely unusual. And this is even pre-COVID in a sense that companies that do not pay sufficient attention to the ESG matters will be the losers overall. That performance ratings in ESG in the long term 
contributes to uh, uh, companies' uh, sustainability. So the, the response to the COVID uh, uh, crisis has been tremendous uh, in the, on the part of mining companies and, 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 and in terms of supporting communities at large, providing all these uh, basic necessities, uh, as I mentioned earlier. And of course, all of this with a view towards uh, securing their social licenses to operate. Um, Sorry, I was, I was uh, disconnected. Um, so, so basically companies have responded tremendously well. And I think uh, this is, this is uh, the future trend that we are going to be seeing, not just with COVID, but even in the post COVID era. Um, uh, one of the commentators that came out after the uh, COVID experience with regard to the ESG, is that your performance during the COVID crisis will come back to haunt you uh, in the post-COVID era when, when you try to access capital. So this is a very important point, particularly for Canadian companies that are involved in the natural resource sector. But very quickly in terms of the resiliency, uh, in terms of managing resilience uh, of the supply chains, I think companies are increasingly re sort of trying to balance the trade-off. Uh, do we have a short-term um, sourcing of supply chains outside the local economy? Or do we start now to see what are the options available locally? Uh, and and we, there is enough evidence to suggest that in jurisdiction after jurisdiction, um, mining companies, um, especially jurisdictions that have more than one or two mining companies are getting together with local small medium enterprises to review their procurement strategies and procurement plans with, with a view towards helping local invest, uh, uh, small uh, suppliers to, to pool resources together, to giving them better terms of, uh, of payment uh, uh, in terms of the uh, uh, procurement and, and being able to beef up their capacity to supply given the shortfalls that we are seeing in global supply chain. So I think this is, this is a very, very good development. We also have uh, other companies who are actually moving away from global supplies and beginning to make contacts with uh, regional uh, suppliers, you know, in terms of trying to prevent such similar shocks uh, in the future. And I think this is a very good development. Uh, as I said, supply chains uh, uh, in the local economy is not only good core business, but also has a long-term benefit uh, not only during moments like um, uh, COVID or emergencies like climate change, but also in the long term, supporting the local economy uh, in the context of companies' uh, ESG record, but also indeed shifting away the focus of uh, host governments, focusing extremely uh, excessively on revenues. One of the things that the African Mineral Development Center has discovered over the years in supporting mining, uh, uh, the mining sector in countries is because there's limited linkages of the mining operations with the local economy. Host governments tend to focus exclusively on, on the fiscals. In other words, on the tax revenues, uh, either royalties or corporate taxes, because there's no other linkages that the economy uh, is benefiting from in the context of mining. So developing local supply chains in the long run will help sort of divert some of the extreme focus on revenues coming from the taxation that host government puts on mining and rather focus on developing local businesses, which then has uh, linkages and other uh, sort of multiplier impacts on other sectors of the economy. So then 
what happens in the future moving forward? Um, I'm limited with time, so I'm not going to focus too much on what is happening now, but let's look at the future. I think COVID-19 has only confirmed a trend that was already beginning to take shape in Africa with regard to supply chains. Increasingly, I think there's a new paradigm, as I said, that is emerging with regard to how do we develop local uh, supply chains uh, in terms of capacity, in terms of technology transfer, in terms of um, really having a possibility of linking up local supplies with global supplies through some kinds of uh, investment agreements like joint ventures that would provide opportunity for local value addition. I, I think uh, uh, Zamed said it correctly that although the value of investments, FDI in Africa in the natural resource sector is huge, but overall the value addition is quite limited. Upstream from exploration to the mines development in terms of construction of the mines, as well as downstream when the commodities are actually extracted. We need to look at all the value chain to see what opportunities exist for African economies to contribute to the value addition, both as suppliers, and, and that's basically uh, part of your manufacturing sector, supporting your manufacturing sector. At the end of the day, mining supplies are consumables within the mines themselves. So these are inputs that can easily be manufactured through local uh, 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 plants and, and processing of, of basic chemicals and other inputs. And of course, services that can also be sourced locally, increasingly with uh, uh, expertise in Africa. Uh, there's, there's a huge uh, inflow of African diaspora you know, skills that are coming in. So right across the value chain, whether it's in the upstream uh, investment packaging and accounting services, banking services, or midstream where you need architects and construction engineers that will help develop the mines, but also increasingly mining engineers and, 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 and mineral processing engineers, all of these can be sourced locally. Or better yet, we need investment structures that will link global expertise with local skills to form viable joint ventures in the service sector, in the mining sector, which has multipliers in all other sectors. So what we are seeing in the post-COVID world, uh, indeed, in, in the context of climate change, the imperative of climate change will continue to be present. And not only in terms of the emergency that it creates and the need to have suppliers and to strategize to be able to avoid such similar events as we've had in COVID-19, but also in the long term, the carbon emission footprints that supply chains, global supply chains have on the continent. Increasingly, we, as you, all of you uh, in the natural resource sector know, the, the whole issue of decarbonization in the mining sector is taking hold. And what we are seeing is that what we call uh, scope three uh, carbon footprints monitoring. Increasingly, mining companies have to account for it. And how do you account for it? How do you better perform in your carbon footprints is using local supplies. And this is part of the entire ESG performance ratings that are going to be imperative to the mining sector. So the argument for building supply chains at the local level is uncontestable. I think COVID-19 has pushed it to the forefront and I think we need, to, we need to take it seriously. Lastly, but not least, I want to focus on the battery economy uh, that is uh, emerging. I think uh, Benoit referred to it, that a whole new global economy is emerging, going to be built on clean energy, the energy transition is already here, and African minerals will play a key role in this whole transition to the clean economy. And what we need to do now is to look at it, to what extent can we add value? to the local supply uh, 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 chain that would then play a critical role in terms of the African mining sector. 
If you look at uh, cobalt, lithium, graphite, all these major uh, uh, energy materials or, 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 or battery minerals are sourced in Africa, but oftentimes with very little, if any, value addition. Yes, indeed, most of the supply chains in the battery industry are now sourced out of China. And, 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 and it's clear that with COVID-19 and the lessons that we've learned, the shift is going to move away from China to mostly Europe or North America. So what do we do? We need to have some deconcentration of supply chains in the battery uh, sector. And most of these can become closer to the mining site, which is within Africa itself, where the, most of the commodities for the battery economy are sourced. So let me wind up here by just saying that the argument for relocating supply chains out of China and other highly concentrated areas uh, is clear. Now, most African governments over the years have put in place local content policies and frameworks so that they can attract investments to be able to participate in the value chains of their mining sector. And the opportunity presented by this, uh, you know, COVID-19 is quite clear. And as I said, the imperative of climate change has all contributed to reconfiguring the dynamics in the landscape of so global supply chains. And Africa is ready to host most of the supply, provide, uh, 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 providing supplies to the sector, uh, uh, you know, should be located right closer to the mining sites, both locally, but also within sub-regions. Uh, the African Continental Free Trade Agreement also provide a regional framework through which there will be easy mobility of uh, supplies uh, within sub-regions. Uh, if you take West Africa, for example, uh, clearly these are opportunities that should not be missed. So I will end up here and we will leave the rest to the um, Q&A. Thank you. Yes, thanks to you, uh, Kojo. Thank you so much. So interesting. Uh, the ESG aspect of the mining development is, is going to be crucial, as you pointed out. Uh, the Canadian companies, as you know, I'm part of the, uh, this industry for 25 years. We've been at the forefront of the CSR approach. And uh, it's, we, I, we will be part of this new boom in the industry coming very, very quickly. Just want to add maybe one little statistics because we are in the battery material uh, industry and currently there's just a few battery material plants in production currently and we're already short massive sulfide nickel we're short cobalt graphite is in equilibrium there's probably four or five plants currently in the world by 2022 there will be 143 plants building batteries for computers, telephone, and mainly for cars and trucks, 143. I don't think there's five at the moment. So, and you're absolutely right. The graphite, the cobalt, the nickel, the manganese, it will come from Africa. There's no doubt. So your intervention is so to the point. I mean, I hope we have all of that tape because I'm gonna be using this for my road shows worldwide with you guys. You're so to the point of what's coming in the coming years. Our next speaker is uh, Jean-François Arsenault. Jean-François is the Managing Partner Operation and Finance at CPCS. CPCS has been in our environment for 50 years. Uh, they were founding members of the Corporate Council on Africa. I mean, they are close to our heart. They are part of what we do. Jean-François is an economist by training, uh, has a strong executive experience in Africa, Asia, North America with uh, emphasis on uh, PPPs, project and infrastructure. Uh, he's acquired his experience over 100 mandates for both public and private clients, cover mainly transportation, mining, and the energy sector. So very, very, uh, these are topics of the day. As managing partner for finance and operation, he oversees the proper execution of all CPCS mandates and ensures the financial stewardship of the firm. 
Prior to his current position, Jean-François initiated and, de and, and developed the Francophone Africa Division for CPCS, which is something as well that we're close to. He also has experience working with the Africa Development Bank, the Canadian International Development Agency, the Bank of Canada, and the Center for Studies of Living Standards. So, Jean-François, I turn this over to you to add to, the, uh, to the, our, our discussion that we're currently having. Jean-François. Thank you, uh, thank you, Benoit. Thank you to, to the previous speaker. Uh, as an economist, I really appreciate uh, uh, these interventions, which were very, very relevant. Uh, uh, I think they, they gave us a very good picture of the future of Africa, which, which we believe is also very bright. Um, so, uh, uh, my intervention today is going to be a lot, a lot more focused on 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 how uh, uh, how COVID has impacted uh, our operations initially, uh, uh, how we reacted, but uh, and then you know how we see the future, uh, how we see the future of operations. So, what's new? What's different? What's going to be accelerating? And, and and what's the impact on on the way we will do business uh, in a, in in Africa as as a Canadian firm? Um, so CPCS is a global management uh, consulting company with deep roots in Africa. We have eight offices in Africa. Uh, we have 120 employees. Um, you know, uh, we're focused on, uh, as, as Benoit said, on, on transportation and, and on power in terms of the uh, sector. We work a lot on the mining sector uh, through, through our infrastructure uh, nexus. So a lot of uh, uh, heavy, heavy mining company, uh, uh, mines uh, re re require railways, uh, et cetera. So, so we work in there uh, a fair bit. And, and our focus is really on strategy, uh, transaction advisory and, and project development. So we work uh, we work as a captive developer with Africa Africa uh, uh, to develop a number of, of projects throughout the continent in terms of uh, logistics and, and and power. So that really puts us in, in the middle uh, of the African growth story. Uh, so I, I mean uh, the, the future of CPCS. Uh, we share the future of Africa. Uh, so the success of Africa is is is, is, is our success, and, and we are very optimistic. So I think. Um, you know, that, that gives you an idea of, of, of where we come from. Um, so, you know, for us, business is people. Um, so when, when we look at, uh, at, at, at the crisis and, and where we come from uh, and, and what's the impact, uh, the, 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 the first thing we thought about, a, okay, what's the impact on people? What's the impact on us? What's the impact on our clients? Uh, and then, of course, we think, what's the impact on business? Um, but one flows from, from the other. Um, so. I, I don't know if my presentation is being shared. I, I don't see it on the screen, but, uh, or, or should I? Okay, I'm, I'm the one controlling it, perfect. So, yeah, so, maybe I'll, I'll share that to you. So, so what, what's the impact on people? Uh, for us, in, in the short term, how, how did we live it? Um, you know, there, there was a lot of practical concern in the short term, uh, you know, uh, how do we arrange remote work? How do we get people safe? Um, um, you know, uh, how do we get more information on what's happening on, on to inform our, our decision process? How do people get more information? Uh, so there was a lot of, of, of concern. We work in, in, you know, we have people in 20 different geographies. Uh, they, they, are, they are wondering. In, in the medium term, uh, you know, practical concerns, I think everyone's living it, working with kids, uh, uh, impact on productivity, mental well-being. How do, we, how do we accomplish what we need to accomplish? Because projects don't stop. You know, uh, nothing is as formally stopped in, in all of our operation. You know, we, we have about a hundred projects ongoing. Uh, I think I think two have, have, have stopped. The other one maybe has slowed down a little bit, but but everything is still ongoing. Um, how do we deal with the IT and emotional space uh, that that everyone has, and and how do we deal with the real tragedies uh, that we had ever in our in our network? I mean, let's let's be let's be real here. We have one of our of our of our uh, associate, the associate, has been working with CPCS for. For, you know, 10 to 15 years in, in Tanzania. Um, uh, so, you know, ex uh, uh, director of the railway, you know, he passed away from, from COVID. Those are real tragedies. It, it's a real impact. We can't, we can't ignore that. Um, and, 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 and that goes into the long term. How, what's the impact on our people? What's the impact on our clients? But, but what's the impact on employees? How do we really share the value of the company displayed during the, the crisis? You know, um, I think uh, Dr. Kojo mentioned companies will live with, with the, the, the consequences of this crisis for a long time and how they decided to deal with this crisis. Um, and that's as true as how they deal with, with the community around them, how they deal with their employees. Um, uh, and, and, and for us, it was a very real concern from, from, from day one. You know, will, will, will people want to work with us and for us uh, in the future? Um, and that brings us to the impact on business. Uh, uh, you know, we are a global company. Um, and one thing that I found fascinating uh, managing a global company at this moment is that the, the timing of the impact was clearly differentiated by geography. Um, 
So we have a number of our staff in Canada, we have a number of our staff in the US, we have a large number of, of our staff in, in, in Africa. And, and uh, I would say Canada was probably the first, the first place that, that we acted in, in, in Canada, uh, you know, uh, after Europe, of course, had, had a sense. And we, we, as management, we all wanted to react. But people in Africa would say, like, nothing's happening here. Like, there's no concerns for yet. Uh, same thing in the US. Um, so there, there was a real trade-off between decision-making, swift decision-making and, and consensus building. And I think it goes to the core and the strength of, of, of a company that, that works in a large number of geographies and, 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 and a large variety of, of geographies where, you know, we need to consider the local realities. Um, and, 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 and so we decided to focus on, on practical concerns. Um, in terms of the medium term, uh, I think, you know, like clearly a clear reduction in, 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 in the velocity of work. Um, you know, there's fundamental uncertainty, uh, uncertainty about the timing, um, um, you know, and while we don't have any concern for the, the survival of the business, I mean, we, we, we are a very resilient business, and, 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 and I'll be frank, the one of the reasons we're a, a resilient business is because we work in Africa. Um, um, uh, Africa is resilient because the environment is particular, uh, uh, it has challenges, and that makes for resilient uh, people, resilient businesses. I think we're seeing it in, in, in terms of African businesses and businesses like ours that work in Africa. We're very diversified, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, and, and we're well anchored in our market. Um, so, so, so that allows us to not be concerned about the sustainability of the business, but really to unleash our, our differentiator. So creativity, the closeness to our clients and, and, and their realities and the shared vision. So, um, you know, I, I won't spend more time on that, but I think it's good to, to set the tone, you know, what, why, why does this matter and, and why does, 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 will that have an impact in the future? It all goes stems from, from there. Um, so quickly, when, you know, I, I'll just sh share that because I think it's important also to, 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 to understand, you know, how do we take care of our people? Um, you know, so for us, uh, we were all working remotely in one day, so we were clearly uh, ready for this. Um, you know, uh, we, we repatriated some people, we, had, we, we, we put some safety uh, uh, missions in place for people who, uh, that remain locally. Um, you know, um, we continue to have an impact on the ground. Our offices remain uh, uh, fully staffed. Uh, some people can go to the office for short periods of time in some countries, but, you know, in reality, nothing has fundamentally changed. Um, I think what's really changed is the level of communication we have, and both internally and externally. So we reach out to all our clients uh, very quickly, individually, to try to find solutions. Um, and internally, you know, we, we instituted a weekly town hall uh, with, with uh, above a, more than 100 of our employees joining every week. Um, and, and we try to reassure people with very clear vision of the future for, for them. You know, at the end of the day, in the middle of a crisis, people, people want to know how it can impact them. Um, and, and, and we really didn't minimize the, the emotional side. Um, I, I think, uh, you know, both with clients and, and, and with employees, these, these, these moments become emotional and, and decision making can be affected and, and the way you perceive the world, it, it can be affected. So, well, you know, one, one, one thing we've done is we really dialed up the emotional content. I think people want to feel connected. Um, I think this is one of our strengths normally, you know, to feel connected to, to, to uh, across our global network uh, of employees, of clients, uh, but we really dialed it up. Uh, we had some small competition. Uh, we had a nursery rhyme competition where people made fun of me. You know, I think uh, we, I have one here, uh, roses are red, our logo is blue, our name is short, and, and JF is too. I'm not the tallest guy, the tallest guy in, in, in the company, as you can imagine. So, so that, that's what we did. Now, let me focus on what, what, uh, what I think is what people are most interested in in, in, in terms of this, this, um, this webinar. So what did we do in terms of operations to keep, keep business going? Okay, uh, uh, what did we focus on? So I'll show you a little bit of, uh, of, of, of the solutions we, we put in place with our clients uh, to some of the problems we had. Um, and, and then I'll, I'll segue into what we see the impact of COVID could be and what we see uh, uh, the changes that we see from, from COVID and, and what would be the impact on, on businesses, not just our businesses, but, but other businesses that, that operate in, in Africa. So of course, we, we leverage the additional time we had uh, uh, we really intensify our, our top leadership content. Uh, uh, you know, I, I mentioned some some of it there, but we, we have a we have a few uh, uh, a few content on, on how we see uh, aviation taking back in, in in the next few years, um, and 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 how it could be done. Uh, we we have a, a piece on on African railways uh, and uh, African railways financing. So uh, a, a lot of the things we work and we work on for a long time. Um, uh, it allows us to to share that that knowledge. 
Um, we've done some pro while well, we've done some pro bono work related to COVID impact on CCCs. As you can imagine, a lot of these deals that have been made, uh, that's a risk that was not fully, uh, fully baked in <laughs> into contracts. Um, so, so that that uh, there's a lot of review of contracts, um, you know, review of of, of, of ongoing deals um, and, and and how they're going to be impacted. So, so we we're, we're doing some some pro bono work for, for a few clients uh, across the continent on 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 this. Um, but in terms of, of how do we keep operations going and, and what are the, the elements we, we, we look at? So, of course, one of the big shifts we, we, we've seen is a lot more openness from, from people we work with to, to new, new ways of doing things. Um, and, and our strength is to really be anchored in, in, in the markets we are in. So uh, you'll see that some of the, of the solutions here really depend on, on your ability to be embedded in the market. So. Um, the first one is we had a virtual workshop, or we, we had a workshop we needed to, to do, uh, but the client, you know, rightly indicated that they didn't want to want their participants uh, to pay, uh, to call in, et cetera, and, and, and they don't all have access to the proper technology. Um, so this was in Ghana, and, and, and we've, we've, we have an office in Ghana, we have people in Ghana, so, so we talked to the telecom companies um, that run a, a, a free uh, toll-free lines uh, for churches across Ghana. Uh, to, to run services. Um, and so we leveraged their infrastructure that they put in place uh, uh, for the spiritual community to, to run our, our workshop, workshop and, and participants will call for free. Um, I think this is a good, a, a good, um, a good example of how to, to leverage you know, uh, local knowledge and how things are done locally uh, to, to run international, uh, international business. Um, Another one, uh, uh, you know, which which we, we will be running soon is is a virtual evaluation uh, of, of a, a proposal for a long term concession. So the, these kind of things are very sensitive. Uh, there's a lot of uh, security issues and, and information management issues that that are that are going into that. Um, so I, I think it's going to be one of the first time anyone does one of those uh, uh, long term concession assessment virtually. Um, so we are all quite intrigued as, as to how this will go. Um, but I think the, the openness of doing this this way um, really stems from COVID. Uh, no one would have would have been comfortable doing this uh, unless this was the case. Um, and, and and the last one is really technology uh, technology focus. Um, you know, uh, we do a lot of transportation work, uh, and it's, it's really critical to 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 assess the viability of deals. Um, and and traffic assessments are key. Uh, and, and so we, we, we have a, a, a project in Lagos right now where, where a traffic survey is, 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 is required. Um, but let's be frank, uh, uh, no one can be sure that traffic patterns during the crisis are, are, are reflective uh, of, of what will be you know, the reality for long-term infrastructure. Um, so, so we're designing a way to, to do a traffic survey for benchmark it to satellite ima imagery before and after the crisis to really benchmark whether uh, uh, the traffic we are capturing for the deal is is uh, is is appropriate. Uh, so 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 it's quite out of the box. It relies on a local team that that gathers the the, the primary data, um, uh, but also on on an international team that, that that brings on the added there. So this this is how we're dealing with the crisis really. But what does it mean? How do we see the crisis changing the way the way business is done? I think fundamentally, our, our fundamental view is that it's not going to change the way business is done because business remains, and as that's true everywhere in the world, business remains about people and relationships. That's the key. When you, you when you invest in a deal, you're investing in the people that carry that deal. Uh, of course, the fundamental deal matter, but but the people matter at least as much. Um, so that fundamental will not change. Uh, now, the, the way of building trust, the way of assessing risk. Uh, uh, will change. And so I'll, I'll go quickly to our view of, of some of these things will change. Um, at least in the medium term, we see that traveling will get more complicated, uh, restricted, expensive, uh, or, or the perception of risk related to travel will increase. People may want to travel less. Um, I think that's, that's a reality. Um, and, and, and that one thing that, that will turn into is that the importance of proximity will increase. Um, I think it really goes to the supply chain uh, question too. Uh, you know, if, if mobility is reduced, proximity is more important. Uh, we see it in our operation. I mean, we in, in the medium term, we definitely see regional travel uh, open up well before international travel is fully open and, 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 and functional. For example, uh, so we see uh, uh, the, uh, we, we we firmly believe that the ECOWAS region in, in Africa will open up uh, uh, to travel within within the region well before traveling from Canada becomes 
fully open with no quarantine and no and no and no restriction. So we will, you know, we have an Africa program where we'll we'll send a number of our, of our people that are not located in the office today to our offices to be able to keep 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 running. Um, but that's the short term impact. The long term impact is that we're really ramping up. Um, um, the, the sizes of our office, the strength of our office to expansion and acquisition locally. Uh, and, 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 and we really think that that will remain a big differentiator uh, and, and, and a necessary part of doing business uh, in Africa uh, and anywhere, of course. Um, in terms of the technology, um, now during the crisis, I think a lot of the, of the, of the stakeholders are, with, with whom we interact have increased their comfort in the use of new, uh, of new technology. Um, and, and, and we think that will be a sustained change. I think, I mean, when we look at Africa, adoption of, of technology, you know, especially like, uh, it's never really been the issue. The, the infrastructure was more the issue and it remains the issue today when we, we, do, uh, we do these things. Um, but I, I think uh, now with, with the crisis in, in terms of, uh, you know, going to a new and more resilient economy in Africa, um, it, it, infrastructure, uh, ICT, infrastructure will will be massive investments we believe because it's necessary for Africa to continue to grow they have the talent to leverage that infrastructure um, and, and and now we have the proof that that they, they, they there's a willingness and an openness to to leverage it to to a full, uh, a full extent so I mean um, as as uh, the as the media mentioned initially uh, I think you know Africa is already ahead uh, ahead of many uh, more developed economies in terms of adoption of those new services uh, you know uh, uh, banking, uh, uh, most most notably, um, but but we see that going going and in, 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 in increasing, accelerating. Um, now, what does it mean for our business? I, we 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 really think that it's going to improve the efficiency of process. What I would call process is a discussion, contract negotiation, more frequent checking. It's going to increase the trust that's already been built because there's going to be a way to interact on a more frequent basis. Um, but it won't replace the core activities, uh, you know, the, 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 the initial relationship building, uh, developing sustainable trust. It's just going to make it easier for people who have that infrastructure, that trust infrastructure, that social uh, uh, infrastructure that they have with the people on the ground. They're going to be able to leverage it more strongly with, with technology. Um, I think, you know, when we look in terms of deals and how deals are going to get done, I think it will, it will accelerate the, the building of trust. Uh, uh, between uh, international investors and, and, and local investors because it's going to be able to have, there's going to be this level of comfort to have those, those additional interactions, checking uh, on, a, on, on a continual basis. And, and that really goes to the question of risk. Um, now, when we talk about Canada and Africa, I think risk uh, or the perception of risk, I think is really at the core of the issues Canadian investors have with Africa. Um, we, we, we've a number of times engaged with uh, institutional investors from Canada to try to bring them into deals in, in Africa because I mean, we both develop projects uh, where uh, uh, the English are, are involved, the Europeans are involved, the local investors are involved, uh, we're trying to bring the Canadians in those deals and, and there's a perception of risk or, or, or a lack of knowledge about Africa that, that, that really affects the way they, uh, they perceive it. So how will this crisis affect how Canadian company, and I'm, I'm going to focus on Canadian company, um, assess, assess risk? Um, now, I think, you know, initially, in the short term, Canadian firms will, will go to what they feel is less risky. And it's not going to be, it's gonna, you know, because the, the crisis is going to reduce their, their risk, risk appetite in the short term. That's, that, that, that's our view. So, so there's not going to be a, a, run, a run for, for investment in places like Africa. But I think as, as things unfold, um, that, that perception will change. Because um, we see Africa as being a very resilient place to do business in the context of, 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 of pandemic, for, for example. It's, it's diversified, there's different, uh, there's, there's, there's different types of economy, and there's a high level of growth. So the rebound is going to be very high. Um, and, and as these economies, uh, you know, if we look at the resiliency of, of African economies, especially given the limited fiscal capacity, um, um, it, it's amazing. Uh, we look at the IMF, uh, IMF projection, and, and, and if we exclude the countries that are suffering from the oil stock at the same time, uh, you know, which, which I think is a, is a particular situation, the rebound is much stronger in, 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 in most African countries than it is in, in developed economies. And that's despite all the money printing that's been going on and, and all the investment by, by government. 
So the, the, the internal resiliency of the, these economies is, is, is going to be seen. And I think that will, that will affect the way people assess the risk of, of, of investment positively. Um, we also see an, an increase in, in the speed of, of IT telecom uh, investment. And as I mentioned before, I think the addition of technology will allow uh, Canadian firms, Canadian investors to gain a higher level of, of confidence uh, because they will be interacting with their, with their African counterparts uh, on a more frequent basis, uh, and, and it will change the way they perceive these countries uh, uh, pretty quickly. Uh, we really, so we see, we see in the, in the medium term, in, in three to five years, I, I, we, we feel like Canadian firms are going to get a lot more comfortable with, with Africa compared to, to where they are most, most of them right now. Uh, of course, you know, when we talk about um, mining companies, they've been comfortable to do business anywhere in the world. I mean, that's the nature of, 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 of mining companies. They, 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 they take risk uh, and, and they go where their, where their resources are. But we think in terms of other investments, uh, we're gonna see a, a boom in, in, in the, the level of comfort of Canadian institutional investors uh, to do business in, in Africa. Um, in terms of demand, uh, so, you know, in terms of funding uh, from, from, from international financial institutions, um, I think in the short term, uh, for, for us, it's clear that there's gonna be a shifting uh, of those of that funding. I mean, we've already seen in some projects where institutional investors are shifting money away from infrastructure projects, when infrastructure project developments at this point, to to crisis management and and related matters. So, what did they focus it on? They focused on health, uh, local production, uh, uh, you know, uh, on on resiliency uh, projects. Um, now, will, will that be a sustained a sustained impact? Um, um, we don't think so. Um, you know, there, there's some shift in the short term, but I think uh, as, as it is in, in, in developed economy, as, as governments want to spur, uh, 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 you know, investments, they will focus on the big ticket item and that, that become, that still is today, uh, infrastructure. So, um, uh, so there's no clear picture of the future yet, but, but we do believe the investment in, in infrastructure will, will, will at least continue at the level it was going before. Um, now, one, one of the things that's really changed and, and, and we think it's gonna continue to spur investment in, in infrastructure is that there's a number of, of transportation services or, or, or power companies or state-owned enterprises in Africa that, that are facing real issues right now. Um, COVID has just you know, made, made some of the weaknesses even more obvious, uh, obvious. Some of them are going bankrupt, some of them just don't have any funding and they, the governments don't have the capacity the fiscal capacity to sustain those state-owned enterprises for much longer. Um, so the reform process, which was already really well started before the crisis, I think will accelerate. Um, and and that those, those reform processes tend to open sectors to the private sector into additional investment. And that, we think that's going to accelerate investment in Africa also in, 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 in the coming years in terms of, of what demand and, and infrastructure sector we, we expect to see. Um, and then the, 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 the last thing we, we think about, of course, is, is supply. Um, you know, we have a set of services uh, um, and, and there's gonna be, there's gonna be a lot of money around and, 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 and a, lot, a, lot, a lot of available investment money. Um, so what, what's gonna happen, um, you know, with opportunities arguably lessening um, in, in the short term, at least in our sphere. Um, so um, the competitive landscape will change, um, you know, especially if, if the market proves resilient, uh, we see more people coming in the market, um, but on the other side, we see less people focus on cross-border business. So a lot of businesses that, that do operate there will focus more regionally. Um, so the way the way we see it is is really in line with with our proximity uh, approach. Is is that's going to be the, the importance of the local capacity uh, of the local investors is going to become more important. Uh, they're going to play a bigger role, um, and 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 that's the way to to really get. In those markets and, 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 and get a, a strong anchor. So um, you know uh, it's gonna it's gonna get more competitive, uh, but the nature will shift. You won't be able to just uh, uh, come in and come out, uh, fly in, fly out, or, or, or do those, that kind of business. You, you'll have to be anchored in the regional or local market to really do business, um, because because of that fear of cross border or border business, and and and, and that that a lot of the uh, the bigger players will will have. So that's that's basically what what we feel is new from you know, uh, due, due to COVID and how it will, it will uh, you know, affect business in the future for us and, and, and for Canadian investors. So yes, that's, the, that's my presentation for today.
Okay, well, thank you very much, Jean-François, for this presentation. And I think you're leading the way with your, your factors into uh, Patrice's presentation on airlines and how we're going to get around and how we'll be able to, to uh, travel to Africa from Canada. I think this is, 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 is a critical element, which is, is now part of our new reality. Uh, just before we go to Patrice, uh, I'd like to say that we already have 25 questions. So I think we will be uh, very busy with the question period. But if you do not have access through Zoom, you can send your questions to on WhatsApp uh, using the 1-819-743-6423 number. So 1-819-743-6423 number. And that is on WhatsApp, and you can send questions there. Nola will be uh, managing the questions coming in. As I said, we already have 25. Patrice uh, Malacar is the Vice President, Quebec and Atlantic Provinces of CCA Africa. So he's, uh, he's a part of the team. Uh, Patrice has a background in commercial aviation and tourism. He's the CEO and General Manager of Aviajet Canada. Uh, his expertise is airline sales, marketing, travel, and development business. Uh, he's, he's, uh, he's been part of Africa for a long time and has assisted uh, countries on strategies and uh, on numerous transatlantic routes. So, Patrice, the problem by being the last speaker is you get squeezed in, and uh, that's always our reality. I know we have a lot of questions, so I would ask you, because we have 15 minutes left, so i just ask you, if, I know it's sad if you can be brief, but also tell us how we can go to Africa, because uh, I know a lot of people who want to go and just don't know how to go right now. Patrice? Sure. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, very well. Very okay, well. E excellent. So, Benoit, thank you very much. Uh, uh, I will try to be uh, as brief as possible. Uh, first of all, I would like to say that, as uh, Jean-Francois just uh, mentioned uh, today, it's indeed uh, great to have the possibility to communicate with the uh, new uh, the IT uh, tools like uh, Zoom and Skype and uh, other tools. But still, I, I believe that uh, to do business in Africa, it's still very important to meet our partners face to face, have the opportunity to shake hands and to socialize. And that's why the airline services uh, is so important and uh, of course the airlines are playing a key role uh, in order to uh, allow people to to meet in person so i would like to be uh, i'd like to be brief and to give you a, a short update on the uh, situation uh, as you all know the uh, economical impact uh, on the covid 19 is uh, really created a real disaster for the airline and travel industry uh, as you all know, most of the countries were forced to close their borders around the world. Uh, it's still almost the case now. Um, all airlines, of course, had to ground up uh, almost 90% uh, of their fleet and uh, 20 million of direct or indirect jobs are still at risk uh, until the aviation sector is up and running again. Just in Canada, uh, you know that Air Canada recently uh, laid off uh, almost 20,000 employees, which is representing, uh, I believe, around 50% of their uh, work uh, workforce. And uh, the International Airline uh, Tr uh, Transport Association, IATA, made a catast catastrophic observation recently of the air transport situation. Uh, about 60 million, uh, 60 billion, sorry, uh, could disappear from airlines' cash reserves in the second quarter alone. Globally, the, dem the demand is down by 70% from last year and 90% uh, in Europe. If uh, the airplanes uh, don't fly, of course, the uh, availability of many of uh, these jobs will disappear. And that's the reason why IATA called all the governments to uh, urgently provide financial assistance to uh, the airlines. And I think that uh, at this point, uh, the, in the US, in Canada, in France, in many countries, uh, the uh, governments uh, already announced to, uh, that they will support financially uh, their national uh, carriers. Um, Half of the airlines are still at risk of running out of cash within two or three months. 
and the small independent and low cost airlines which have not yet reached their substantial uh, financial structure might disappear from the radar. In early April, the collapse of the world traffic already reached 80% compared to uh, last year. So uh, the question is how uh, the airlines will uh, restart again. So this uh, restart is complicated, a complicated operation and speed is uh, essential. In the most optimistic scenario, it will take three or four years to reach the level of last year traffic and the same rate of growth. Airlines are already planning to gradually restart their operation end of June with drastic safety and health measures at the airports and on board. Uh, this has been uh, put in place in uh, collaboration with IARA and uh, the World Health uh, Organization to harmonize the measure that will be taken uh, not only on board the aircraft, but also uh, at the airport. So uh, with an imp implementation of new personal safety and sanitary measure to give customer added confidence, such as mandatory pre-flight customer temperature checks, personal care kits containing disinfectant and safety items, electrostatic cabin spraying to reinforce aircraft grooming protocols, and uh, special food uh, products uh, to minimize the crew and passenger contact. Also, uh, customers will have to wear a face covering during their travel, including at a check-in and during the boarding and uh, uh, when they will be directed to the, to the gate. So uh, the onboard services will be also adjusted with individual water bottles instead of a bar service offering um, uh, bar service and uh, the uh, removal of pillows and blankets. So they are put, uh, all the airlines are putting in place protocols to use uh, for the use of personal protective equipment by the employees, including face shield and covering gloves and rounds in the in-flight uh, uh, for the in-flight crew. So it will be, of course, a little bit different to travel uh, this way, but uh, IATA and the airlines are really trying to put in place all the um, uh, safety measure to make sure that uh, people, uh, travelers will not be infected, of course, and uh, uh, they will be uh, able to travel uh, in a safe way. So at this point, uh, several airlines already are already planning to restart uh, part of their schedule uh, by the end, uh, beginning of June and mainly uh, by the end of June, which is, as you know, usually the high season. So uh, for instance, Ethiopian Airlines <clears throat> uh, have uh, still two flights out of Canada and they didn't stop flying because they uh, kept uh, these, uh, this service from, uh, from um, Toronto to Addis Ababa. Uh, with connections uh, to uh, several destinations like Lusaka, Arare, and uh, Maputo. So from Toronto, uh, Ethiopian is still offering a possibility to travel uh, nonstop to Africa. And in June, progressively, uh, Air France will uh, increase its schedule from Canada to uh, Dakar, Abidjan, Cotonou, Bamako, Conakry, Lomé, Nouakchott, Niamey, Libreville, Douala, Yaoundé, Kinshasa and a few other African destinations uh, via, via uh, Paris. At this point, we don't know exactly what will happen uh, uh, with other carriers flying uh, to Africa, um, like Royal Maroc uh, from Montreal to Casablanca, Air Algérie to Algiers, Tunisia, Egypt, and KLM. For, th for those carriers, we don't know yet uh, what is the final planning to uh, restart their service from Canada to Africa via Europe or uh, not directly like uh, Wala Morocco or Algerie. Um, the question that maybe people uh, will need to have an answer is the ticket price. Uh, the usually uh, for the most of the airlines, they need to have an average load factor of 75% uh, to break even. 
meaning that usually they might have like 50% load factor in low season and 100% load factor in high season. Um, now, the plan is to restart in high season. As I said, most of the airlines will start again uh, flying uh, in the month of June, in the core of the month of, month of June. But the problem is that uh, we can already anticipate that there will be very few tourists uh students or seniors or groups uh, traveling because everybody will wait uh, a little bit later to to make sure that uh, everything you know is safe to travel and to spend some holiday in different countries so the traffic uh, the uh, anticipated traffic will be probably limited to what we call the ethnic markets and the business markets uh, people would really need to travel for different reasons. Also, uh, for the time being, and probably the airlines will try to keep uh, some kind of physical distance between the passengers, meaning that they will eventually keep uh, one empty seat between uh, passengers. Uh, and this will have an impact on the load factor because uh, with one empty seat between two seats, it means that the maximum load factor will be 65%. So that's the reason why we can already anticipate that uh, most probably uh, the average uh, price uh, will go up accordingly. Uh, also, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the month of June is already, especially the end of June, beginning of July is high season. So we can already anticipate that the, the, the average ticket price will, will go up. Now, uh, talking about, I'm very uh, pleased that uh, Mr. Negatu also mentioned um, the potential uh, for uh, a major growth opportunity uh, of tourism, uh, for the tourism industry in Africa. And uh, of course, the tourism industry in countries, countries such as Morocco, Tunisia, Egypt, Kenya, Tanzania, South Africa, Senegal, is again deeply affected by this uh, COVID-19 um, outbreak. Uh, these countries were already affected by the terrorism attack in the past and the tourism uh, went down, uh, decreased really in these uh, countries. So it's gonna be difficult and it will take time to uh, redevelop and uh, the tourism to, to Africa. But there are a lot of opportunities and African countries aiming to develop their tourism industry in the future will have to redefine their strategies and also to diversify their markets and vote to focus only on key markets, uh, key incoming markets such as uh, Europe or China. But in this uh, perspective, I, I do believe that uh, Canada uh, um, uh, can offer a, a great opportunity for the African countries to develop their uh, tourism. As you know, Canadians uh, like to travel. Uh, Canadians travel all over the world. Um, and almost 10% of the Canadian population are traveling uh, on international destinations and are um, looking for new destinations. So I think that um, there is a great opportunity for the African countries to develop uh, their market, the, the tourism industry from Canada. And in that perspective, uh, the uh, Canadian Council in Africa can also play a role because we have the expertise how to uh, promote destinations. So that's uh, something that the uh, Canadian Council in Africa could do uh, and could help uh, to promote uh, African destinations uh, uh, from Canada. So um, in order to be well informed about uh, the uh, modification of uh, the schedule of the airlines, uh, because it's changing every day, so it's not easy to give uh, uh, inf precise information on the schedule and the reopening of routes and so on, my suggestion for you is to uh, contact a professional travel agency, uh, um, ideally agencies which have uh, NIATA accreditation in Canada, and also who are member of the ACTA, uh, the Association of Travel Agencies in Canada. Um, these people, they know exactly 
what's happening day by day. They are following all the information coming from the airlines in terms of pricing, in terms of availability, in terms of conditions of traveling. So this would be my uh, suggestion. So thank you for your attention and I will be pleased to answer your question if you have a uh, question about traveling. Thank you very much for your time. Okay, Benoit, uh, would you like me to move on with the question period? Thank you very much, uh, Patrice. Yes, uh, Nola, I'm, I'm sorry we, 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 we ate up all the time, but uh, I believe we can run about 10 minutes. So please go ahead with the questions. Yes, uh, some of the questions are basically repetitive. So I, I'm going to take a, a couple in there that we can focus on. Uh, Zem, first uh, to go to you. Um, uh, people are asking your uh, magic bullet there. Uh, what are the three top risks associated with uh, growth and investment in Africa? Zemede. Sure. Well, I mean, actually, uh, as I said at the beginning, the, the opportunities are much higher than the risk, but there are some things that investors need to look for. One is um, I would invest in countries that have shown a focus, determination for transformation. And this could be measured in their growth over the last few years and what they're planning for the future years. Because as investors, you're coming in to invest for the long haul. Static environments are not going to provide you much of an opportunity. So look at those countries that have rolled out and have been able to implement or are in the process of implementing reform agendas. And I think that'll be one of the things. The second thing is, uh, despite you know all the the positives that we see in Africa, the fact of the matter is a lot of the countries as standalones have relatively small markets. So for investors to minimize, to mitigate risk, it would be, I think, smart to have a regional approach. the country and that's all you care about, that's sort of exception. But if you're in the consumer product space, if you're in the volume business, I think a regional approach, like investing in one country, but looking to service will defray your, uh, your risks, okay? Ultimately, as I said, countries that are investing in their people will have a huge competitive advantage. I've always said this, South Korea has only 50 million people, yet it's amongst the top 10, 11 economies in the world. It reached there in the span of just 50 years by investing in people. So companies that invest in people and those young Africans I talked about earlier that are inventing the Africa version of Uber, the Africa version of mobile payments and other things, those will be the ones who do well and others who don't invest in Africans and who don't have, by the way, local partners. And so that is something I mentioned, I failed to mention earlier when we look at success factors of those who did well, and those who didn't, one of the key determining factors is partnership with locals. You know, a lot of Africans are talented. They may not have the financial capital of a multinational Canadian or American or European co company can bring, but they know the local market. So those who ignore to partner with locals have a higher risk of failure. There's, there's other things we could talk about, but I think just you asked me to narrow it down to three, I would say for, the, for this discussion, I'll highlight those. Okay, thank you very much. And um, just to follow up on that, um, people want to know if you can just elaborate just very uh, uh, a little bit on uh, this uh, African, um, uh, basically um, uh, free trade, uh, Pan-African free trade uh, agreement that they've been signed. Sure, and, and brief, uh, it's, the, it's going to be the world's largest free trade area. Uh, by number of countries. There are, every African country is going to be part of that. So you have a huge open market. Think of the EU, but escalated from 26 in the EU to 54 in Africa. That's in a nutshell what it means. Because today we have a spaghetti maze of regional trading blocks which hindering growth. You have Kamesa, ECOWAS, SADAC. I mean, at the end of the day, businesses want to be able to move freely their products, goods, and services. They want to be able to invest across Africa and people. So if you free them up, 
like the continental free trade is designed to do. It's a long-term process, but it's an excellent size. One of the biggest achievements of the African Union, I think, in a long, long time. So that's what it means, a, a free trade area replicating EU, but on a bigger scale. Okay. Now, um, uh, the, the, the question here, I know there is uh, the, uh, the, the free trade basically agreement between the countries, but now um, the, the question is, what's the prospect of negative impact of the mining supply chain with the border containment policy of each country in Africa? Um, yeah. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes, yeah. Well, th that's a very, uh, very valid question in the context of COVID-19 restrictions and lockdowns and so on. Um, already there are indications that there's some constraints uh, with supplies moving from, uh, say for example, from Durban, South Africa to DRC, Congo, uh, where most of the uh, supplies come through that corridor. But these are sort of short term, uh, I think in the medium to long term, there would be some agreements uh, as, as countries realize how vital these sectors are to the economies to ease some of these uh, border restrictions and allow movement of critical supplies to pass through. So I, I, it is a constraint at the moment because, uh, you know, especially in Southern Africa, from what I understand, uh, within West Africa, uh, there's also a huge uh, sort of corridor uh, in the context of gold mining, uh, but there, there are no reports of such similar constraints as you find in West Africa, I mean, Southern Africa. So, so my, my guess is that these, these will ease over time, but in normal times, uh, once we overcome COVID-19, um, there will actually be facilitating uh, these cross-border services and supply chains across all over the continent, as, as has been said earlier. That's the whole purpose of the uh, Continental Free Trade Agreement, that services can actually move uh, over and above uh, domestic uh, labor laws or domestic uh, trade laws uh, and have a more sort of regional uh, approach to uh, mobility of both labor services as well as manufactured uh, goods, which, which really bodes well for regional supply chains. And that's the very point that I was trying to raise that, uh, uh, you know, this factor mobility that will be enhanced by the uh, CFTA uh, will definitely help the mining sector. If you take West Africa, for example, a lot of the supplies in the gold mining uh, uh, sector in West Africa comes through either Ghana, Cote d'Ivoire, or to some extent, let's say Lomi, Togo. Now, if you have CFTA or Continental Free Trade Agreement, you could easily set up some of these supplies in one country. If you want to make Ghana a supply chain hub, and then you get free access to all these uh, countries that have uh, gold mines that need the specific supply. So definitely the regionalization agenda will be enhanced by the uh, CFTA uh, once it is uh, you know, adopted. Uh, you know. Okay, uh, are we good there? Sorry, because it was kind of cut off there, on my side. Kojo, can you hear me? Sure. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah. I, I did, so, did, sorry, I, I lost you for a minute, but I have concluded. Uh, did you okay. hear whatever I said? Yes, no, we, we, we got what you said. Thank you, thank you. Just now, another question here to uh, Zemede. People want to know if uh, your company, the company that you are global uh, chairman, is interested in uh, investing in uh, entities that providing services to mining and agricultural uh, uh, sectors. Right. So uh, the, one of the five sectors we focused in is um, a natural resource. Although to be very frank with you, we have yet to do one in that space. So it's something that's sort of attractive, not necessarily the actual extraction part of it, but the value addition as you just mentioned. So yeah, we'll be happy. On the agriculture side, agro-processing, absolutely. 
I think, uh, you remember that number I, I, I mentioned to you, we import in Africa $40 billion a year, even though we have 60% of the arable, uncultivated arable land in Africa. And that number is going to go to 110 billion in five years. So smart investors who have the capacity to convert the beautiful raw material, the coffees, the cocos, the, all the other things that Africa produces, but it's processed offshore, we're happy to participate in. Okay, well, um, I will uh, really wind it uh, up here. Uh, I think, we, as you can see, there have been so many questions, interests, and we still have uh, over um, uh, 170 people online still following us. I think the interest is high here. Uh, the topics were very good. Thank you to our speakers, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this was an uh, excellent uh, presentation. People have been following a lot of, lot of interest. Uh, you want to learn more, to know more about uh, what's happening on this space, join Canadian Council on Africa. You can just go to our website, ccafrica.ca, and you will see more information. Uh, we are going to have uh, some of these uh, presentation on our website. Uh, the information will be there and uh, keep sending us the questions. We'll forward them to the speakers and we'll make sure that you can get the answers that you are looking for, uh, you want to know. But the bottom line here is Africa is in the business. That's the message I get. That Africa is in the business. Africa is waiting for its partners, Canadians to go. So this is very good news. And um, I think those who had doubt, had question, I think you have it now that Africa is open in business and Canada is open, uh, is willing to join Africa. Thank you very much. Thank you to our participants, all those who came to join us at this uh, uh, special event. We'll be seeing each other again. We are going to have a number of uh, um, webinars and some are going to be just focused in French and uh, we'll be letting you know and we'd like to have webinars that are going to be focused also on the countries. Uh, as you can see, the style is the same, focus on issue talk about tangible, how this is going to help you and listen to the Canadian companies that are on the ground, what they are doing with them. Thank you very much, all of you for being here with us. And uh, I wish you success in your business in Africa. Don't forget to check out Ethiopian Airlines. They have been tremendous. They have been excellent in moving our people from Africa to Canada. As uh, Patrice said, they are still flying and they even brought us uh, cargo of uh, uh, medical um, equipment here. So the only way you can thank them is you to start flying Ethiopian Airlines. So that would be great. Thank you very much. And um, I wish you a nice day. Thank you. Thank you.